Okay, awesome. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us again on our webinar. This is Kathy Wong. I'm just going to have everyone introduce themselves, but um, I am the director of Endometriosis Center and the director of benign GYN surgery. I'm Gabby Algarova. I'm one of the OBGYN, OBGYN residents at NYU Long Island Hospital. And hi, I'm Nicole Heinzman, and I am a professor of radiology and surgery at NYU Rangoon, and I um, am also the director of female pelvic imaging. Great. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. So there was a, I don't know how many of you guys got the update, but we initially wanted to do the sexual wellness webinar tonight, but due to an emergency, family emergency, Lara cannot join us. She's currently in South Africa. So we're hoping to do that at a different time. Um, but uh, tonight we're gonna go over um, imaging and emerging diagnostics for endometriosis. So I'm just gonna set the stage and then um, ask Nicole some questions about our collaboration and what you guys need to know. So first off, endometriosis, as we know, is when the lining of the endo, uh, the lining of the uterus grows outside of the uterus, right? So historically, the way we have been diagnosing endometriosis is via laparoscopy at, or even open surgery. But I actually have many, many patients who come in and tell me that you know, that is the only way to diagnose endometriosis. And I want to say that that is not true. So Nicole and I have been working together closely on this specific diagnostic approach. So Nicole, why don't you go on and tell us how this came about and then we can go from there. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and you know, I come from a family where there's a long history of endometriosis in my family and my mother had her ovaries removed, you know, after having the three of us. And then my sister actually has extensive endometriosis. So um, I was particularly motivated to kind of learn more about the imaging of this. So I went into medical school and after medical school, I did my residency in radiology which is most people think of X as x-rays, but it involves MRI and ultrasound and all kinds of diagnostics. And so after about five years of um, residency training, I did a fellowship and then I kind of specified in looking at MRI imaging. And that was what I did my fellowship up in Boston. And then I came back to NYU in 2007. When we started, it was basically thought, like Kathy said, that you can't diagnose uh, endometriosis on imaging. And that's really because we weren't good at it. Um, and then as the machines have gotten stronger, ultrasound probes have gotten more sensitive um, and MRI has gotten a lot more accurate. And the more powerful it is, the smaller things you can see. So classically, we can always diagnose a large ultra ovarian endometrioma on ultrasound, which is, you know, everyone is used to it. You go to your ob you get imaged like for your, if you are pregnant and they'll do that in office a lot of times and you can diagnose an endometrioma by a cyst in the ovary and it looks really classic. Where we have trouble is um, when it comes to deep infiltrating endometriosis, which is often the cause of really subtle pain. And for that, we've only started getting used to diagnosing that maybe over the last five years or so. And it has classic features. Often you will have an ovarian endometrioma and that will trigger to look for it, but it's really kind of, you see this infiltrative loss of borders but it's something that even today, I would say maybe 10% of radiologists are really good at diagnosing. And I think it's one of the important reasons to have an endometriosis center where people are actually looking and you work with your gynecologists like Kathy and Gabriella, and you, they tell you this patient has a lot of pain. I don't think that it's negative. Can you look again? Can you make sure you look in the areas we know are affected by this condition? And it's really when you start looking closer, you start seeing things that are there. And I give these talks at national meetings 
And a lot of the radiologists will come up to me afterwards and say, I still don't know what you were pointing at on those images. Like it was invisible to me. And you have to study. And I'll tell you some of the operations that Kathy and Gabriella do are among the most difficult operations that any surgeon does because um, they go so deep and they go deeper than most normal gynecology surgeons or even general surgeons go to look for the disease. And it's in a very tight area that um, is very scary. I'm married to a general surgeon and he says, I don't go down there. It's, that is a scary area. You can cause problems with the bladder, problems with the rectum, he, in the ureter. He says, absolutely not. And in the setting of endometriosis, which is so, um, it's, it's, it's very um, uh, angry. And so that's why you're in so much pain right? It's like so angry and it's just the, the borders are not clear. It looks like blood everywhere. It takes a real specialist to be able to go down there that deep and see all that and fix it. And so most centers don't have that expertise. So it's really important to get feedback to say, hey, you missed this. We just had a conference last week and Kathy said, can you look at three, three cases where your colleagues didn't pick this up. And I, again, I have to say, okay, we're going to get better next time. We're going to look harder and I will give them the feedback so that they can get better. And um, it's a constant learning process, but yes, it's something we've started focusing on and we've gotten, I hope, better and more accurate and give a better roadmap. For sure. I think one of the main reasons that I thought this was so important is that it, it just seems absurd to me that is, you know, now it's 2021, that we would actually use surgery just to give a diagnosis. So there are patients who come in with chronic pelvic pain. Some patients have endometriosis and some patients don't. So it's very important for us to one, to even figure out, does the patient have endometriosis, right? So that's number one. And so if the patient does not have endometriosis, surgery certainly is not the right treatment option. So once we figure out if the patient has endometriosis, let's say the answer is yes, then it is also about does the patient need surgery or medical treatment. And then it goes into, even if we go ahead with medical treatment, we'll go, we will, I'm sure have another session on with ablation versus excision surgery, but then surgical planning. So one of the reasons I left my own institution to come to NYU Langone was because we were doing these I would say crazy endometriosis cases and I'm doing it robotically. So small incisions, right? The patients would be able to go home the same day when doing these dissections. And then the colorectal surgeon comes in, opens the patient because they're not used to doing laparoscopy or robotic surgery. And the patient ends up with an open surgery for her bowel resection or we didn't have the conversation with the patient at all because it wasn't picked up on imaging. So now I'm left with, do I leave this endometriosis lesion behind because I was I didn't have the proper conversation with a patient or you know I go in and take it and you know then having to have a conversation with a patient afterwards which is not, neither one of those situations is ideal so for on Wednesday specifically we had a patient who had a endometriosis lesion that was surrounding her ureter which is a tube that connects from the kidney to the bladder. She had significant urine backup. It actually went into the bladder. So it was a two centimeter lesion. The patient had like 10 other resections in the bladder at a, a different institution because it didn't pick up endometriosis. So she's been going through treatment for almost a year, not knowing that the diagnosis was endometriosis until she flew in from Colorado and we did her surgery on Wednesday uh, with urology. Dr. Lee Zhao was my partner. We have so much fun together. <laughs> it's really fun for us to operate together. Um, but so that was a really incredible case, but without pre-op imaging, I don't know if I would have known for sure that this is one, uh, uh, the right procedure to do. I may not have been able to have that proper conversation with a patient. I wouldn't have had Lisa out in the room with me. So there's just a lot of pieces put together. And 
I mean, let alone all that. I also don't want to do unnecessary surgery. There are times that patients come in with chronic pelvic pain and diagnosis isn't endometriosis and surgery is not the answer. And we talked about this last time as well, that you know, there's many different components to the pain, there's physical pain, there's emotional pain. So sometimes it's a combination of both, right? It doesn't mean one, it's not exclusion. It's not this or that, sometimes is and, and, right? So it could be the history of sexual trauma with positive diagnosis of endometriosis. And then again, in this scenario, it's gonna be two plus three equals eight. Your pain is gonna be completely out of control but there are many different aspects to the pain. So we don't wanna focus on you know, doing a bunch of surgery for possibly a negative diagnosis of endometriosis. So that's one of the reasons that we thought it was so important to partner with our radiologist. And when I came to NYU, I have reached out because like we were just talking about, there's no way the radiology department can read your mind and know what you're looking for or what you need during your treatment for the patients. So I think it is the onus is on the gynecologist who's seeing these patients in the office to reach out to say, hey, I'm having this problem. Do you think we can work together and solve it together? And then having these conferences and meetings on a regular basis so we can iterate and improve the diagnostic accuracy. So we would bring either imaging, um, the pictures from the surgery, and sometimes video if we're lucky enough to, to have recorded that portion. And then we'll go over the actual MR images to see how can we together improve upon the diagnostic accuracy of MRI. Gabby, do you have, what are your thoughts? Any clarifying questions? Um, so I think that both of these pieces are really important. Before I worked with you, Dr. Fong, I didn't really consider imaging to be a particularly useful tool for endometriosis, um, aside from sonogram and seeing like an endometrioma, which is a very obvious sign of endometriosis. Um, but having worked with you and seen all of the different MRIs, it brings to question, how can we, to me, how can we work together with our radiologists moving forward and what pro protocols is it that we are using to um, in the imaging to identify these and how to go through this iterative process because that can be very beneficial since patients with endometriosis can or suspected endometriosis can often go through not just one but multiple different surgeries that have either come up negative um, or endo or come up positive but they have ongoing pain, et cetera, et cetera. So how can we kind of compact that a little bit for the patient's benefits? Yeah. It, it is challenging. I mean, I think we were taught <laughs> in residency that you know you have to diagnose endometriosis and gold standard mm -hmm. laparoscopy. Well, I, I totally forgot for the attendees. You can type any questions into the QA box and we'll get you at the end. Um, the other thing is obviously we have Paul, which is such an amazing partner. And I know it's still, we're still very new. Like Nicole said, I think the last time we looked at the data, we were 76% accurate, which is really not bad. And then, but I think mm -hmm. this is so pervasive. There's still patients coming in all the time saying, what do you mean you're sending me for MRI? That doesn't make any sense. You have to diagnose me with surgery. So I think mm -hmm. we, we need to, Yes, that could be true still in many different hospitals and institutions, although Nicole's really leading our efforts, well, not our efforts, mm -hmm. like the global us efforts um, in, in trying to move this forward. So I want Nicole to elaborate on that a bit because yeah. it's a lot of work. Well, I mean, I'll tell you. So in my field, which is called body imaging, um, we are part of the Society of Abdominal Radiologists, which is our kind of one of the flagship um, groups for body imaging, those of us that are in academics associated with hospitals. And um, as part of their kind of one of their initiatives, it was to create these diseased focus panels. And I submitted a few years back um, for there to be an endometriosis disease focus panel and Kathy was the clinician um, correspondent. And we uh, 
we did this in conjunction with Mayo. And basically the whole overarching goal is to improve diagnostics in terms of imaging and hopefully to have that improved diagnostics, improve patient care. And if you kind of even just Google Society of Abdominal Radiology Endometriosis Disease Focus Panel, you can see what um, the site has. It has recommended patient resources. It has recommended um, uh, protocols, uh, which are essentially the recipe that we use to um, tell the MRI techs how to scan. And we go through and we have teaching cases as well. Hello on the site. And uh, we essentially try and try and do that to um, get kind of a more uniform diagnosis. We also have recommended templates for reporting um, so that people can go through. And um, when you get a report, you have all the areas um, that Kathy needs to know very clearly outlined. And so that's kind of been a big initiative the uh, goal is for everyone to use the same kind of language here. For mm -hmm. some reason, I will tell you, female pelvic imaging is still um, very much uh, kind of a niche field in body imaging. It's, uh, it's mostly um, kind of led by mostly women radiologists um, and it's usually a small niche field in um, body imaging. And so it's still, I think, because it is kind of challenging and, you know, because of other barriers around, you know, women's imaging in general, um, it often is, it has, it's been a lot of trying to get advocacy to get more kind of um, recognition in the broader kind of journals and have more of a space in plenaries. Um, you know, some of the older radiologists um, mm -hmm. at our institution are like, who cares? Who yeah. cares if you diagnose it or not? I'm, I, this is kind of some of the resistance you get to it. And Wait. they'll say, so what um, if, she, oh, she's over 50, who cares if she has a hysterectomy? Things like that. And it's like really pervasive kind of um, that you, fight this in kind of even in the medical community. So it's, it's been a bit of a push to reach kind of um, a point where, you know, women's imaging and women's diagnosis and women's pain is kind of a, a priority. And that's one of the things we're trying to do and advocating and trying to partner with, um, you know, gynecologists and getting this kind of diagnostic message out there. We, I, okay, I'm learning so much today because I did not know that. I did not know there, I mean, I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised. I was just talking to Chris um, on Friday. We were talking about, you know, the, the relative value for a hysterectomy versus a prostatectomy and prostate is three times as valuable as a hysterectomy, which, you know, just, I guess I, underscores the disparity between <laughs> women's healthcare versus men's healthcare. So I am surprised that the people would say, well, who, I, again, I'm surprised and I'm not surprised because I think even within gynecology, we have people who would say those very same things. And that's why really on a separate note, we're trying to start a uterine preservation program, but because I do obviously endometriosis surgery, but I also do a ton of myomectomies. But so a majority of my procedures are not hysterectomies. And I, and Gabby's like, yes, yes, that's true. Because Gabby's been with me in the office seeing patients. And there are times that patients, doesn't matter how old they are, they say that I, I'm done with childbearing and want to keep my uterus. And occasionally when we, have these discussions, I definitely have colleagues who say to me, why are you doing a myomectomy? Why isn't this a hysterectomy? She's done with childbearing as if the women is just a, a birthing tool, which is, I, I always say that if it is safe enough, medically safe enough to do so, why can't we honor the woman's wish, her, the patient's wish to keep her uterus? Because it is her organ. 
um, it is not mine. And as long as it's medically safe to do so, I don't see why not. It's not my place to judge and it's not my place to take away her hope or however she wants to identify with her womanhood, whatever that means to her. And I think the, uh, so just one more sign <laughs> about this because it really makes me crazy. There are still also many gynecologists out there who would suggest that a hysterectomy is a cure for endometriosis. I know this is not exactly the topic of our conversation here, but by definition, endometriosis is outside of the uterus. So then it it's, makes no sense, no medical sense or no logical sense or rational sense that removing your uterus would actually be helpful for the treatment of endometriosis, which by definition is extra uterine. So there are still a lot of misconceptions out there, right? So that's one, but um, really, I guess it doesn't surprise me too much. Just, yeah, which just so you know, Kathy, there are two questions in the Q and A. I don't know if you want to. Jen, <laughs> or not, there's three. I have to. Jen, I have to ask you a question. Okay, can a patient use Nicole's expertise template protocols to help educate? her local team when they tell her they can't diagnose endometriosis? Yeah, I mean, yes, you read my MRI for my op plan, <laughs> Kathy, so thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, no, uh, well, thank you. Um, so what I, I guess what I would say is, it's actually, I mean, in, we try and we do try and have outreach and we are trying to, there's a whole, um, movement to have local radiologists get better at diagnosing this. Um, I mean, it's, it actually is something that even at, like Kathy gives feedback to me, I give feedback to my group and it takes, um, it takes a kind of a bit of practice in the back and forth, but yes, that is the goal. That's why it's posted. And that's why there's kind of these educational things. I'll tell you what radiologists generally do to get better at things. Um, we often have what are called workshops. And so your local, you know, CME agency, continuing medical education agency will say, I'm putting on a workshop and you will take 50 anonymized images. You will give them about every, all the attendees, a bunch of lectures, and then you will have them sit at stations looking at the images and they have to go through each one and make sure they make all the findings. And it's usually like a three-day course, and then they walk away with better knowledge of how to do it. We've actually been trying to roll out these workshops, but again, like I said before, we've gotten resistance because they say, oh, people don't care about women's imaging. So you won't get enough people enrolled to do these workshops who are interested in it. So like we, we've tried, Wendy Van Buren, who's my colleague at Mayo, has been petitioning to do this for the last like six years and it's been very slow going and um you know and I, again it's it's something but yes you're right in spite of that those are other areas and there are research there is research um and we've been um you know posting what research on it um but it's still kind of in that um kind of pre-acceptance phase right now um so prostate imaging as the corollary, everyone loves to compare to prostate because like Kathy said, um, you compare the, you know, XY organs to the XX organs and you see the disparities and mm -hmm. there's disparity in how Congress um, reimburses it. Uh, usually, of course, the XY gets more in all of these. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's, you know, and yeah. there's a number of lectures on how this really is extremely biased, but there's not much being done around it. Um, but similarly, so if you look at PIRADS, which is the prostate, um, it's the prostate um, reporting and data system, and it scores prostate cancer. If you look at that, it took them about maybe 10 years of using MRI to grade prostate cancer on imaging, which the same as endometriosis, everyone said you couldn't do it. They were like, it's not an imaging diagnosis. You can only diagnose it by biopsy. And um, it took a lot of research for it to finally gain traction. And it wasn't until 
um, the radiologists partnered with a lot of the leading urology societies that they finally started incorporating it. And when they could get it into their biopsy um, systems, it finally took off and now is considered standard of care. So if we look at that, I would say we're mm -hmm. still in that prodrome, that early period before we've gained enough traction around this to have a reporting system and a kind of um, a more acceptance of it. But that was a very long-winded answer to your question. No, no, I, I thought, thank you so much. I think that is what we see in Europe and South America is, is that there's a lot more ultrasound being done, but they're not being done. So the, the difference is that the OBGYNs in America who are doing ultrasounds are primarily doing OB ultrasounds, like maternal fetal medicine doctors. Whereas the, the practice is slightly different in Europe and South America. We do see a lot of research being published on in terms of how ultrasound can be a very good tool as well in terms of diagnosing endometriosis. So I, we're not quite there, but I think obviously all the work that Nicole has been put in into this to standardize our protocol. And I do think the feedback, because I, I'm, I think quite a bit of the time, if you know, the radiologist reads a scan and you know, have these, I don't know, 20 findings, 10 positive, 10 negative, and then you're not the one who actually takes the patient to the OR because it's a surgeon. And then the surgeon never actually tells you, hey, you know what, you were correct 80% of the time. These are the, and it's like, uh, these are the ones that, you know, maybe we can work on. If there's not that kind of relationship, then it's hard for the radiologist to improve in a vacuum. There has to be a feedback system, right? That one of the reasons surgeons hopefully get better is when they when they do something that they're not supposed to, the feedback is immediate. You get into a complication. Whereas the feedback, the time of the feedback is even, you know, far, pretty far out, right? So you could do an MRI, we could do an MRI like in January. And I may or may not operate on the patient until July. So there's such a long time between that you, you may not even recall, what did I actually do in, like what, what was I looking at in January? What was going on with this patient? And so I think the other part is for the doctor who refers the patient for MRI to really have a detailed history. Like what were the complaints? So that clues you in into, hey, what am I looking for? If the patient has painful bowel movements, I'm gonna maybe pay a little more attention to the bowel part, right? If the patient has painful urination, maybe I should look at, look at the bladder part more carefully or even you know zoom in on that. Or if the patient has painful intercourse, hey, maybe there's something going on in the rectal vaginal syndrome. So I think it's, again, the, the, it's a shared responsibility, right? Like if we never reached out and said, oh, I'm having this issue. Like, I don't know what to do when this patient shows up with these complaints. What do I do in this scenario? I don't want to take her to the OR just to for a diagnostic lab because I think that's completely unfair. Um, how can we work together to get to a better place? Um, Gabby, do you, what do you think? I'm trying to read these questions right now. So <laughs> tell us your thoughts. She's you gotta unmute. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. It's really hard to um, first start building that relationship with the radiologists that are reading your scans to even start that conversation and feedback cycle. So it can be very difficult to um, move this forward in, in that way. There's definitely like a time lag um, and there are a lot of, there is a lot of pushback in terms of um, women's health in general, um, but as a medical student um, and as a resident, I feel like a lot of um, the students that I worked with um, have wanted some kind of focus in women's health um, in whatever field that they were going into, specifically when I was in medical school, um, a lot of the students were either going into medicine or radiology or opto or cardiovascular, something or another, and they wanted specifically a focus in women's health within the field that they were interested in. So I'm hopeful that in the future, 
um, we will have more providers who are willing to push for women's health and things like women's health imaging will um, be paid more attention to because there are more people interested in um, providing that care to our patients. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree because it's not just the gynecologist who's working on women's health, right? Like I've been talking yeah. about this XX brain thing like to anyone who is willing to listen about a hysterectomy will de- increase your chance of early onset dementia by 38% even with bilateral ovarian conservation. Again, so that's a gynecologist working with a neurologist, right? Like how do we really treat the whole person, which is like, my new mantra, <laughs> surgical excellence is not enough. So that, because I only know how to do surgery. I, I honestly have no idea how to do anything else, but we, how do we then come together and help the patient? Because at our endometriosis center, it's not just the radiologist. It's not just Nicole and I, right? Um, she obviously has a whole team and we do as well, but there's also powerful physical therapy. We have acupuncture, we have psychiatrists, we have fertility specialists and other surgical colleagues that I was just referencing earlier um, in the talk about how we really work together as a team to give the patient the best care that we possibly can because we all know a different, slightly different area. We have different expertise and how do we then come together? Western medicine is so parsed out. I just want to tell a random, not random story, like how Eastern medicine works. So I go get acupuncture every Friday, which I've been talking about all the time. Lara is my acupuncture slash traditional Chinese medicine doctor that we, I refer almost all of my patients to. So the other day I was telling her that I was exhausted. So she put a needle on my head because she says that we needed to bring all the chi up. I'm like, okay, whatever. Um, so then she comes in in 30 minutes and she's like, Kathy, how do you feel? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I think I have like a headache. I have like a migraine now. So she takes a needle out, puts two needles on the bottom of my feet. And like, I swear to God, immediately the headache went away. And I'm like, what did you do? So it is a completely different system that I don't understand at all. And for me, I'm like, oh, I have a headache. So you need to put something on my head. I just never thought of, okay, actually take the thing out of my head and put it on my feet. And then I, I swear the second the needles went in, my headache went away. I was like, oh, this is not magic. It's just like a different way of going about medicine that I don't understand. Okay, sorry, I need to address some of these questions. I think this one has an anonymous ask, What can patients do to help push the advocacy forward for better imaging practice for women? That's a great question. I'm going to ask Nicole. How do you think the patients can help us? You know, that's, I think, I think that's a great question. I do think that um, I often will say that a lot of these changes do come from patients demanding it. Like when patients push to have certain things and when they kind of make a case for wanting to have this kind of imaging and um, the data comes with it, then it is. But you mean like, I guess it's like, how do you kind of, you know, besides mobilizing and demanding it, you know, have advocacy on a greater level? Um, that's, that, that's definitely tricky. And I guess this kind of gets into um, a lot of the you know, nuances of how you get prior authorization, which people are writing also in the chat is a burden um, for getting MR imaging. And there's different hoops that the various insurance companies want you to go through in terms of documenting how long you've been on, you know, an inset or some type of, you know, OCP. Um, so I, I, I do think that patients drive change and um, it sometimes can be long. I mean, I do think right now there is a little bit more attention being made Mm -hmm. to um, the long neglected kind of um, experience of women in medicine. And I do think people are starting to realize that, you know, just kind of the talks showing the different level of what women are um, kind of even allocated in terms of, you know, for reimbursement, like if you're on OCPs versus what men get, 
and how women pay more out of pocket in general. Mm -hmm. um, I think I, I think that these are all great issues that you know I I try and engage um, you know politicians that are engaged around reimbursement and how CMS and things um, will allow these procedures. It's definitely challenging right now when there's been a um, huge amount of a demand to like decrease uh, imaging and kind of decrease over imaging. So I don't have the, the right answers. I try just like you guys try. Like I said, my sister um, has bowel invasive endometriosis and she um, she's in Germany. And, um, you know, she had several surgeries in the US where they missed it um, because they weren't endometriosis specialists like Kathy and didn't go down low enough to find it. And then it, she, and, you know, we just labeled her as a complainer. And even in our own house, we were like, oh, she's complaining again. And it wasn't until like she finally got the right surgery. We were all like, oh my gosh, like we're, we're such jerks. And like, she won't let us live that down by the way. Like, <laughs> nor should she. But um, and she was like, you guys used to say I was just making it up. And it was all over the place. We were like, oh. Anyway. I, I, wait, this is great. I think a lot of people who are joining the conversation can totally relate to that. But Justin made a good point. Can people write to the Society of Abdominal Radiology? So I think AAGO has a patient advocacy group, sort of. I mean, it's not very active. Does Society of Abdominal Radiology have something similar to that? The answer, I think no, but that would be a great idea to have it because I think radiologists tend to still be the unknown physicians. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. our, our role used to be the physician's position. Like mm -hmm. we would communicate with the doctor and the patients would never see us. Um, and it's essentially, it was, uh, it was a hidden field. And I think there's been more of a role. I'll bring it up with the SAR leadership and say that this would be a great thing to start because mm -hmm. there is, there's this whole concept of imaging 2.0, like mm -hmm. beyond being the a physician's physician, we should start being the patient's physician and actually doing what patients want us to do and doing it well and, and being subject to some of the, you know, unsolicited negative feedback about our performance, which we've been mostly shielded from. And there's kind of a push to say, should we be more exposed to that to provide better care? So I'm sure I'll bring it up with SAR. I know, but I mean, like, I think we don't, I definitely do think radiologists are in the shadow, so to speak, because you guys help us so much and you guys don't get thanked, right? Like currently there are lots of people on the chat thanking you. <laughs> but again, but again, that's not, um, you're not visible to the patient. So even though you are absolutely, I think radiology was the first contact I made when I moved to NYU. I'm like, this is the partner I need because I know <laughs> this is what I need to get better care to my patients. But there's a lot of, um, it's just still isn't being done all the time. So I know there are questions about prior authorization. There's a lot of conversation about surgery is a gold standard, which is um, I, I don't, which is precisely why we're doing this, obviously. We're kind of going in a circle in terms of, we want imaging to be the gold standard for diagnosis of endometriosis. And how can we, all of us here who are here together, help push that forward? And from us, like we have been partnering with, obviously we have uh, in terms of uh, AEG, our, our professional organization, which is American Association of Gynecologic Laparoscopists. And we also have a patient advocacy group, which is, I think, not super active, to be honest. Um, and we've been obviously partnering with our radiology colleagues. So we will have to continue to push that even more forward. And how can we make it bring awareness to this is how we can diagnose endometriosis and not subject the patients to a general anesthesia. Yes, surgery is safe, but it's not safer than MRI, right? That's That would be like ludicrous to think that undergoing general anesthesia is safer than getting uh, MR imaging. And it, yes, is it invasive? Possibly when you're doing the, you may have to put vaginal gel. Again, but that's 
not any more invasive than a transvaginal ultrasound. At least you have complete control of that. You're doing the gel yourself. So I think there are a lot of benefits and very little risk to the patients in getting imaging. And there's not even any radiation in the MR imaging. So there's really very little risk in that. Um, well, so, so Bama here says, I guess MRI is not yet a standardized procedure. It is not. What will it take to reach there nationally, internationally? We're working on it. We're trying. <laughs> That's what we're trying to do. So we need all of your help to do this. What else is going on here? Let me see. Why doesn't, oh, why doesn't the radiologist go over the results with the patient? No, the, 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 the doctor who orders a scan would have to discuss the results because you don't just, I mean, I'm going to assume patients when they get results don't just want to hear results. You want to know what to do. What does it mean? What is the treatment option? Right? So it would be too much for Nicole to just tell you, okay, you have endometriosis on the lung. And then you say, well, what do I do? And then she would say, you have to see a doctor and surgeon to take it out. I, I don't think that's a fair burden. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you that's, it's such an interesting question. You're asking that because, um, it's a heavily debated issue, like I said, um, because there's this, like I said, there's this whole push for radiology 2.0. Right now, Michael Recht, who's my chairman, is starting this new thing. And I don't think he's told the clinicians who, like Kathy, where he wants us to start video narrating our reports and pointing to the areas of abnormality where when you open your phone and you open the app, you can you can open the video report mm -hmm. and see the radiologist pointing at the images. Kathy's shaking her head because she's saying the Girl, problem. Right. I love it. Yeah. Right? Oh, it's it's interesting because um, so that's he's rolling it out. It's supposed to start going in live, but they just had one of the initial meetings on it. Um, there are concerns, right? Because like let's say there is an unexpected bad finding. What do you do with that? And do how do you want to get that report? Most people want to get that from their physician. And so this is the whole debate is, you know, and so Kathy was saying radiologists are sh don't get thanked, but we also don't hug our patients in the room when they've just gotten a diagnosis that's devastating. We don't hold their hand and we don't work you through it so we're kind of we're kind of separated so we don't do either of the spectrum and is that <laughs> wrong um it, it and so it, it's unknown so you you guys are obviously incredibly smart i see someone talking about covid research that's like should be applying for an nih grant no one's thought of that whoever they're talking about covid and inflammation mm -hmm. brilliant idea i i <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. That research. No, we're gonna get done. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that either. I haven't heard anything about the COVID. Yeah, and these patients are so yeah. smart. They should be um, mm -hmm. in a uh, advisory group. I know. No, no, I think we, part we, of the. We do. We're trying to form a patient family advisory council for endometriosis. So, and everyone who is here who wants to join that, please let us know because we need these. We need to know, you need to be part of the conversation, right? We need to know what you want. We can try to empathize. We can try to imagine ourselves in your shoes, but we are not in your shoes. So if they, you guys have, what am I saying? Like if you guys have opinions, advice on what you think we should tackle, we're all ears. Cause we are just feeling our way through this maze as, just like you. So we have a little more ex, I mean, not expert, we have a little more medical knowledge, but we need to know what we can do for you. What is it that you need from us the most? You know, it may not be the things that we thought you need. So we just need you to tell us what is it that you need? I mean, these are all really thoughtful, amazing questions. Okay, sorry, I totally cut someone off. Joy, another question. It is scientifically logical and socially responsible for a clinician to use a collaborative approach to treat the patients effectively. Oh, Joy, this is, 
you have to ask a question. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> what are the policies for women such as myself who have been successfully treated to communicate with leadership on the importance of teamwork being key to breakthroughs and discovery in the medical field? Okay, so we are gonna form, this is exactly the answer, right? So we're gonna form a patient mm -hmm. family advisory council and every single one of you are invited. So this is, I love these questions. I love these questions. Okay, sorry. I'm taking over too much. Thoughts from either one of you. No, no, um, I was gonna say there was another question. I'm just trying to make sure and look at the ones that we skipped. But um, so one of the um, questions says that she was diagnosed with endometriosis in the late nineties, had two laparoscopic surgeries and she still suffers from the same pain. Um, and it's presumably the endometriosis. I have a new guy who doubts my endometriosis diagnosis because it doesn't show up on the MRI. I feel defeated. Do you have any advice? Um, so. I can, I can sort of say that um, uh, I don't, one, sometimes the MRI may not have uh, been done in such a way to pick up subtle disease. That's one, but I guess I'll toss it over to Kathy because this may also get into the um, full concept of when imaging fails you. And I'll tell you, so many, I have a number of colleagues who have had horrible pain and they get in and they look at their own image and it doesn't show their horrible pain. And we're radiologists and we think imaging is everything mm -hmm. and it's imaging has failed us. And we'll sometimes just say that. And I guess Kathy then deals with what you do. So I, I, one, it, it depends on where the imaging was done. So I'm, I'm like, if it wasn't done at NYU, I just, I just saw <laughs> the tour I'm like doesn't mean anything it's negative at your home institution it means nothing to me you're gonna get another MRI here and Nicole's gonna look at it so that's one I'm not actually joking about that really if you come in with an MRI imaging Gabby's nodding her head because she's seen me done this I'm like no it doesn't mean anything if you didn't get it at NYU so one I don't know if it's done at, if it's not done at NYU because I, to my knowledge, no one else in New York City has this type of partnership, has a Nicole at the institution who was actually spending clearly a lot of time and energy to focus on this condition. So if it wasn't done at NYU Langone, I just toss it out the door. I just assume that it could be wrong. I would get another imaging. Let's say the imaging at NYU is also negative. So I would say there are occasionally, there are times that you have stage one or two endometriosis that you know, it could be small, uh, small implants, but as we know, the stage of the disease does not correlate with the amount of pain. So you could have stage one or two and still have a lot, a lot of pain. So that's that's whole, a whole nother story. So it could be that imaging have missed you and you could have endometriosis, that is possible. But another possibility will also be, is it scar tissue from your prior surgeries? Are there other reasons for your pain? I do think while we are talking about endometriosis, more broadly, we're talking about pelvic pain, right? Endometriosis is not the only reason that you can have pain, nor is surgery the only treatment for the pain. So I, I don't know if we can go into even more specifics because I need answers to like the first three questions to, to go into the next step of the treatment. But I think one was like my very first recommendation would be get an MRI at NYU Langone and, and then we can talk about whether or not you have endometriosis. Mm -hmm. um, did we skip over any, I think anyone else? Uh, yeah. So is there oh. a little benefit to preserving anatomy by avoiding a hysterectomy? Gabby, you can take that one. Um, <laughs> so I think that like Dr. Wong was saying earlier, um, today, a lot of times patients are told that they need a hysterectomy in terms for treatment for their endometriosis, but endometriosis is not definitely in the uterus, it's extra uterine. So we have some data that maintaining your uterus may be beneficial in other ways, but not a, a lot of data in either direction. So up to patient kind of joint decision-making between the physician and the patient to decide whether or not 
taking out your uterus is the best option. If it can be avoided and that is the patient's desire to do so, then there may be benefit to maintaining uh, the uterus. But the goal overall with surgery is to restore uh, normal anatomy. So if the if the patient wishes to preserve her uterus, then okay, the goal will be to remove the uh, uh, endometriosis implants and the adhesions that may be the cause of the pain and restore the anatomy to the most normal state that it can be. Yeah, I mean, I think our general approach has been, let us restore your anatomy first and see if that helps. Our first step is never, let me go take out your pelvic organ. The first step has always been, how can we get rid of the scar tissue if you, once you have normal anatomy, do you still have pain? Is your significant decrease in the pain and how can we help you to live your normal life to the best of your, our abilities and your abilities? So the next, the first step is never a hysterectomy. It should not be. So another one is what other supports are going to be available for help after surgery that won't cost so much out of pocket that's actually affordable? Um, it was suggested for me to see a sex therapist after possibly even take power for a physical therapy that therapist is not available for a while, but also costs so much money. I haven't even looked into pelvic floor PT yet. So we have a, I don't know if she's, I don't know if sex therapist is, is her correct title, but she's a psychiatrist who specializes in sexual wellness. And Virginia Sadoc, she does actually set aside 20% of her appointments for $50 each. So this is more of a global problem, right? Mental health, and May is mental health month, by the way, also AAPI month, which I didn't even know. I had no idea. And yes, I'm Chinese. I have no idea that it was AAPI month. I just learned earlier than this month before my panel. Okay, so it is mental wellness month. And yes, this is a huge problem, especially in New York. I certainly don't have the answer to how can we get therapists to be affordable. Um, I'm guessing no one here knows the answer to that. This is a broader issue. Pelvic floor physical therapy is covered by insurance, as far as I know. You may have co-pays, right? That, that's entirely possible, but it is not, not covered at all by insurance. So those are, I don't know if that adequately answers the attendee's question, but I, I don't know if I can actually change mental Public, health affordability. Yeah, public floor physical therapy is typically covered by insurance, but only to a certain extent. Um, oftentimes they will only cover like 10 sessions or X amount of months of therapy. Um, so it, I, it depends on the insurance company that, or none of your insurance type, um, but your pelvic floor physical therapist will typically know ahead of time um, what the status of your insurance is and will hopefully be able to help you um, come up with tools for after when the therapy is completed or at least completed to the terms of your insurance is not going to cover it anymore. Sometimes this is also like based on a yearly thing so they'll cover X amount of sessions or X time a year. And so the next year it's reset. So it's a little bit frustrating because for some patients, it may be a very helpful therapy, but it tends to be needed to be ongoing. So it may, you may lapse in insurance coverage for some time and there is a copay with each session. Yeah, so another one, 3D printing. Can 3D printing be used to assist in restoration of pelvic anatomy similar to plastic or transplant surgery? Nicole? You, you know, that's, yeah, that's also a great question. I mean, um, we actually have a um, specialist who's a 3D printer and actually um, similarly, and I think Kathy, you saw this, mm -hmm. it's got a new PAC system, which is, uh, it's our picture archival communication system, which is how we look at images, and um, it's by Visage. We're transitioning. Um, we're in the middle of the go live this week and the next two weeks, um, and it has new capabilities in terms of what you're talking about um, in terms of providing a better roadmap and communicating better, just like 3D printing does by doing these multi-planar reformatted images 
and allowing it to be seen in multiple planes, just like 3D printing. So yes, that's a great question. And a lot of these um, exciting options are coming through and we are kind of just, we just got that and it was just demoed for Kathy recently. And then I immediately shot an email to Nicole. That was like my first reaction. Before I was even trained on it. <laughs> Is this what we're getting? Because it looks awesome. <laughs> um, so we, we are definitely, I think 3D printing will actually be the next step, right? Like, I don't, I think that actually would not be necessary. We'll, we'll see what Visage does because it looks incredible that I was like, oh, does that mean we can isolate the lesions or even for fibroids, right? Because I, I look at both. So I, I think that will be really incredible um, advantage. And then I think that will probably, again, I don't know yet because we haven't seen Visage and what it can do for endometriosis. Just thinking about last week when I did this rectal vaginal endometriosis and I mean she had endometriosis elsewhere the patient had endometriosis elsewhere as well but oftentimes the tissue is pulled up and what we describe as an iceberg lesion meaning like when you look in you may only see the tip of the iceberg so you don't see like the entire lesion underneath the peritoneum. And once we, if we just, you know, simply ablate or burn, you wouldn't actually be able to restore the anatomy because the colon of the rectum was actually pulled up into that tissue. And once we cut out the tissue, the colon fell down. And I mean, I couldn't, I mean, she was having a lot of pelvic pain with intercourse. So I'm wondering also in the new system, once we have this 3D imaging, just will we be able to actually identify these scarred areas even better to help guide our surgery? But we don't know yet, but it is exciting because I don't think anybody else has it. I feel like our radiology department is just like so far ahead of the curve. Well, I will give credit to Michael Rett because he partners with Google and Amazon and he gets a lot of um, he's, he has a lot of grants with them where he, we have innovative um, sharing and then we have the computer programmers help to develop and translate their knowledge into our PAC system and then develop these tools. So it's um, and it's he's an IT kind of guru. So he goes around and lectures um, internationally about how to develop this. He's a knee doctor. But the rest of the um, the rest of us benefit from the kind of just wide application of these areas of his expertise. Wow! Wait, so I'm now I'm asking questions about Dr. Weck. <laughs> I'm like, wait, hold on. You meet with him <laughs> all the time. You should ask him this the next time you meet. I'm going to be like, what? You you have grants with Google and Amazon, and you can have all these IT cool IT stuff. I love it. Uh, so. We are at 6.58. I, I don't know if there's any last minute questions, but this has been super fun for me. I think the panelists, especially Nicole, because I asked her super last minute. <laughs> so I so appreciate it. Not only just for this, but obviously we've been partnering a long time, not just for endometriosis and really without Nicole, we would not, 100%, we would not be where we are now. This, it wouldn't be impossible so i'm so grateful wow. and kathy you're oh you have one more question just so you know in the chat and the q oh, I, do. I would say kathy is an amazing surgeon um i didn't even realize how good she was until one of the general surgeons who's a colorectal specialist was like i at, kathy asked me to scrub with her on this difficult case and she had to take me through it it was a nightmare and i was like wait a second i thought general surgeon they're all you know, we are the <laughs> best. I'm married to one, so I know. And like, they were humbled. No, no, no. Kathy's still. No. So then that, that question is about fibroids. So this is, we're not specifically talking about fibroids. So we'll, we should, we'll answer that in a different session. Thank you everyone for joining. We will do our next webinar. Hopefully we'll be back on schedule with sexual wellness on fourth Monday of June. So thanks so much. Thank Have you, a good everyone. Evening. Thank you.